All right, guys, so welcome to our first class of The World is Our Classroom with Nature Ninos. And today we have our friend Sarah from Wild Friends, New Mexico, and she is going to share with us some really cool information about pollinators here in New Mexico. And then she's going to touch on some pollinators around the world too. Things are different that we're not used to seeing here in New Mexico. So um, as a reminder, everyone in the class, I am going to have you muted. Okay. But I'm watching for you. If you have a question or you have something you want to say to Miss Sarah, just raise your hand, like your real hand, not even your virtual hand, like your real one. And I'll see you and I'll unmute you and you can ask your question. Okay. Thumbs up. Everybody got it? Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Miss Sarah, it is all you. Great. Well, hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to see you. Um, so again, my name is Sarah and I work for a civics and, and science program based at UNM, but we go into the schools and we teach kids. Um, <clears throat> how many of you came the last time I did a class last month? I think there was like at least one person I recognized. Does anyone remember the other pollinators class that I did? So it's, it's mostly different, but there might be a, a tiny bit that's the same. So if you did the last one, maybe give the other kids a chance to um, answer questions first, if you know the answers, but it'll be a lot of new stuff. So, um, so one reason that I love learning about pollinators is that I get to learn about plants and animals, right? Because pollinators need plants and vice versa. So it's a cool way to learn about relationships in nature. Um, and we're gonna be talking about kind of some tips and tricks for learning about different pollinators, what plants they like, where we might find them, how to identify them. And then like the other Sarah mentioned, I'm gonna teach you about some pretty cool pollinators elsewhere in the world and also about why they're so important. Um, and I might unmute you sometimes also along with Sarah to um, let you answer questions or just ask you to raise your hand or something like that in response. And if you have a question, either remember it because I'm going to try to stop a couple times or you can put it in the chat um, and we'll get to it later. Okay, so I'm going to share with you some cool images and things that I've gotten ready for you. Just a second. Okay. So pollinators around the world and in your backyard. So that's what's awesome is that we can learn about them right outside our door and then we can apply what we've learned and go to other places in the world and, and still have some information about pollinators. So who are the eight animal pollinators? Did you know that there's that many that are good, consistent pollinators? There's more that are like maybe sometimes in specific circumstances pollinators, but think to yourself, how many animal pollinators can you name? Think to yourself, hmm, which ones do you know? Okay, I'm gonna go through some images and we'll see how many of these you thought of. Okay, you can do, give me a thumbs up if you thought of that one. So here we have a bee. Thumbs up if you remembered bees. Okay, probably most of you know bees. They're one of our best, best pollinators ever. And then we have hummingbirds. Who thought of hummingbirds? Okay, how about this one? This is actually a moth. And we're, we're gonna be starting to see more of these, I think, soon. This is called a hummingbird moth. And butterflies, who thought of butterflies? Excellent. So these are the four kind of the ones we think of a lot. We see them. They're colorful. They're usually big enough and, and around enough that we can see them. But there's some more that I'm going to show you, the other four. How about this one? This is actually a wasp. And so wasps can also be pollinators when they're adults. So this is an adult wasp that's hanging out at a flower um, drinking nectar. A beetle. Beetles can also be pollinators. And actually lately I've been noticing a lot of small beetles on the flowers around my house. So I see a couple of you said you thought maybe of beetles. This is a mimic. So this is an insect that's pretending to be a bee. It looks really fuzzy, but it's actually a fly. And not all flies that visit flowers are bee mimics, but a lot are. So a lot of them will be either yellow and black stripes like um, bees and wasps or kind of fuzzy, like uh, maybe like a bumblebee. 
who remembered bats? Thumbs up if you knew that bats were a pollinator. So all of these are here in um, Albuquerque and in the state of New Mexico. However, or not all in Albuquerque, all of these are found in the state of New Mexico. Um, the nectar eating bats are only found in southern New Mexico. So we wouldn't have these in the Albuquerque area, but they are uh, in New Mexico. So why are all of these animals going to flowers? And I, I kind of said it before, but I'm wondering if someone else wants to say, and maybe <clears throat> Sarah, I think you can see all the faces better than me. So maybe you can unmute if someone wants to raise their hand. Why are all of these animals visiting flowers? All right, come, go ahead. Uh, Ella, it's all you, babe. You got to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, to get food from the nectar and to spread the pollen. Okay, so first of all, what's nectar? Remind us what nectar is. Nectar is a substance <laughs> that- Keep going, keep going, you're doing so good. <laughs> sweet, sometimes, and- What's, why do they want that nectar? What, what makes it special? Because it's sweet. It's tasty. sweet. Yeah, it's full of sugars, so it's like juice energy for them, right? So that's the main reason. So all these animals are going for nectar. Imagine if you could just buzz around your outside your house and just get a, a top up of energy, of delicious sweet energy. That's what they're doing. But um, Ella also mentioned pollen, and only some of these animals will go purposely for pollen. The bees are the main one. Sometimes wasps will too, but the main ones that are going to be looking for pollen are actually the, uh, the bees. So they're getting a lot of energy from that nectar. Okay, so let's dive into this flower because we need to find out a little bit more about what um, is going on inside the flower to understand how pollination works and how those animals are so important to the flowers. So I want you to take your finger and find the bright yellow part inside the flower. This is like a typical kind of or standard flower, but do all flowers look like this, you guys? They don't all. So, but we're just going to learn this as kind of a simple way to think about flowers and we'll talk a little bit more about different kinds. So zoom in on that yellow, those yellow parts. Those are called anthers. Can you say anther? Even if I can't hear you, you can still practice. Okay, so that's where the pollen is. Um, and if you look in most flowers, you'll be able to find that part. Okay, now take your finger and zoom into the, the tall middle part. The whole, uh, the very part at the top is called a stigma. Can you say stigma? And I like to say stigma is sticky. So the stigma is the part that will accept the pollen. And if pollen from another flower makes it to the stigma of, the, for example, this flower, it can pollinate that flower. So what happens when the pollen from another flower makes it to the stigma? What is pollination allowed to happen? What can happen next in the flower? Who knows? Who wants to try to answer that question? Anybody? Nope. Okay. So then that means that the, uh, the flower can make seeds. So the only way that this flower could make seeds is if it's pollinated. And if we think about, um, for example, an apple flower or an almond flower, those flowers are going to not only make seeds, but they're going to make the whole container around it, which is called the fruit. So whenever we talk about plants, the part of the plant that holds the seeds is actually called the fruit, even though we don't eat all of them. Um, so one thing that's pretty cool, oh, and I'll just mention again, the stigma is sticky to hold pollen and pollen is like powder. So if you've ever gently rubbed inside a flower, you maybe sometimes get that little um, powder on you. So next time I'm going to give you some ideas of ways you could explore. And one that's fun to do is to see what different colored pollen you can find. Um, so one thing that's cool that I learned when I was making this presentation for you guys is I was like, well, where's the nectar? Like this picture, does anyone see nectar in this picture? Nectar begins with an N. I don't see it anywhere. And so I was looking up, I was like, well, where in the flower is the nectar? Because I know that the animals have to go inside the flower and it's kind of, some people think of it as a way for the flower to trick the animal. So it has to dive deep inside and along the way, it'll grab some pollen on its body. And then on maybe on its way 
to the next flower, it'll rub off the pollen on another stigma. So that's how it moves the pollen from one flower to the stigma of the next. But I was like, well, where's the nectar? So I started to look it up and I found out that every flower is different. So some flowers might have the nectar coming out on part of a petal. Some might have it coming on the base of the stigma. So it just depends on the kind of flower, um, which is kind of interesting to think. And you know what else is crazy? Nectar can be found outside a flower. Have any of you ever seen a bee or another animal drinking nectar from like a leaf? They can actually have nectar coming out on other parts of the plant, not just in the flower. So that's pretty cool. I actually have observed that. Okay, so we're gonna um, look at what this looks like with an animal and then we're gonna act it out because I like to stand up. I don't like to always be sitting around, it's, you know, it's just not that fun, right? So, um, so let's take our finger. We're gonna first practice it with our finger and then we'll practice it with our whole body. So zoom into the first flower and pretend you're that bee and you're gonna get a drink of, of nectar. And maybe you're gonna rub on, if you're a bee, you do want the pollen because you're gonna collect that and you're gonna bring it back to the babies that you're um, growing in your nest. So go ahead and rub against the flower, get some pollen on you. And then you're gonna fly to the next flower and then maybe rub against the, the stigma on your way in. That you aren't really doing on purpose, but you probably are going to. And then dive down and get some nectar again. And then you're gonna go on your way. Okay, so now we're gonna do it standing up. So everybody stand up. So you're a bee. So you have hairs all over your body. So go grow some hairs. Your body's super hairy. Now bees will either carry the pollen on their legs or on their bellies. So you decide which kind of bee are you going to be. These are native bees and honeybees too. They, they carry the pollen on their legs. Okay, so fly to the first flower, take a big drink. Get some, oh look, I got pollen all over me. Well, I don't want the pollen on my shoulders or my head. I'm going to wipe it down. I'm going to be a bee who puts it on my legs. Fly to the next flower, dive deep inside, get some nectar. Oh, look, I got covered with pollen again. And maybe you're gonna rub it off on the stigma on the second flower. And now that flower can actually pollinate. Okay, so rub that pollen down, get it off all the hairs on your body. I'm gonna put it on my legs. And then if you're, uh, this is the female bees that are doing all this. They're the ones that collect the pollen. So fly back to your nest. You're not done yet, little bees. You still got more work, don't sit down yet. So fly back to your nest, and then you're gonna take that pollen that you gathered and pack it into a little snack for your baby bee. So the egg, we'll pretend the egg was already in the nest. You're gonna put it in, and then you're gonna fill in the nest. And then when the baby bee, AKA the larva, hatches, it will have a snack waiting for it. So good job, you guys. We're gonna go back to some pictures. Sorry, I need to go back to where I was. Okay, do you wanna see a real bee? I have a video that I'm gonna show you guys of what it looks like inside a flower. So this is like, you just imagined it and now you're gonna see it. And you'll really be able to imagine it. And there's no sound by the way. So here the bee is going in. My guess is she's probably collecting pollen. She probably already had a sip of nectar. What's she doing now? What do you see her doing that we were just practicing? Cleaning off all that pollen. Can you see the tiny pollen grains stuck to her? All those little pollen grains have done have stuck to her, her hairs just like they're supposed to. Looks like she's cleaning them off. It's hard to tell if she's cleaning them off onto her abdomen. I think she's a bee that puts them on her abdomen. Oh, oh, so competition for some of the pollen and they're gone. <laughs> Oops, sorry. I just forget, it takes a minute to go to the next one. Okay, so why is pollination so important? So we talked about 
when the pollen from one flower makes it to the stigma of the of another flower of the same kind right a lily flower that pollen won't work with a rose flower right a desert willow flower that won't work with a cottonwood flower it has to be the same kind of plant so i'm going to show we're going to talk about food because i love talking about food and that's one reason that pollination is so important so the flower that we just saw was a squash flower who likes to eat squash? Raise your hand. Who likes to eat pumpkin? Maybe pumpkin pie. Yeah, so this is a squash flower that's gonna turn into a pumpkin. Only if one of those bees we just saw in the video brings pollen from another pumpkin plant to the same one. It can't be the same plant. Um, sorry, I forgot about my notes. Hold on one second. Okay, so a lot of our foods depend on animal pollinators. Does anybody know a food that we need an animal to pollinate to create for us? Raise your hand and I'll have Sarah pick somebody if they think of one besides pumpkins. Any guesses? I forgot to unmute myself. Abby oh. and Layla, sorry. Abby and Jamie, go ahead and unmute yourself, guys. Um, so I have we we have cucumber plants and those and those need to um get pollinated so they can grab too. Excellent. So so cucumbers, they're yep, they're one that needs it. Anybody else have a guess? Uh, Jet and Ella, go ahead and unmute yourselves. Um, well, we're growing tomato plants. They're doing very nicely. And um, jalapenos and peppers. Cool. And you know what? I'm glad you mentioned um, tomatoes because tomatoes are really interesting not any pollinator can pollinate them because they their pollen is inside kind of like imagine a salt shaker so it only has a tiny hole at the end so how is a pollinator supposed to get that pollen out how do you think it could get to it if it just has one tiny hole at the end it's basically closed up so there's only some bees that can get to that pollen and the bees are bumblebees and some native bees. Honeybees can't pollinate tomatoes. So what they do is they'll grab on to the bumblebee, or sorry, to the um, tomato flower and they'll actually vibrate it. So imagine if you had a salt shaker and you shook it, right? But most animals can't do that, but bumblebees can. So if you get a chance to watch the bumblebees go from to your flowers in your garden. It's really cool to watch them there. Actually, the sound of the buzzing even changes as they hold on to the flower. It doesn't sound like the same buzz as when they're flying. Sarah, can I mention something really quick too? Just because the kids know I'm an avid gardener as well. And I was having a hard time with my tomato plants because I wasn't getting any fruit and so I was reading up on it and just like you're explaining that the bumblebee will shake the flower to get the pollen out, you can actually pollinate your own tomato plants by just shaking the, the flowers a little bit. So I just take the stem and I shook them and shook them every day for a couple of days and now I have a ton of tomatoes. So it's kind of a really cool trick to share if your pollinators are having a hard time helping you with your tomatoes. So did you have to like actually take the one flower around or? No, neither. So if you, I, I read, I don't actually know the, the logic so much behind it, but I read all you have to do is take the branch that has the flowers on it and shake them, um, shake the branch itself and it will help with the pollination process. Interesting. So, That's yeah, and it really did. Now my tomatoes have a gazillion tomatoes on them. Huh. That's yeah. neat. So yeah. all sorts of cool experiments you can do when you have um, plants with flowers and, and observations, obviously. Oh, it looks okay. like Max has something to share. Max, you want to share something real quick, bud? Go uh, ahead. I was listening to the radio, and apparently um, bees, well, or dormant bees, or some, some bees, they will uh, go into a flower and lay on their side, and they can detach their leg muscles, so they make their uh, wings go twice as fast, and they just go really fast around in the flower to gather all the pollen. 
That might be the same thing that I'm talking about. I'm not positive, but it's similar where the bumblebees will um, detach their wing muscles from their wings. So instead of flying, instead of moving the wings themselves, they're using the same muscles inside their bodies to vibrate their bodies. So it might be a similar thing that we're talking about. That's cool. Interesting. That's very cool, Max. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing, Max. So we're gonna come back to food. I forgot, I, I changed the order of this. We're gonna come back to food in a minute. So hopefully um, you're still hungry for, for more pollinator facts, haha. -ha. So one cool thing about, so kind of like we were talking about um, that those kinds of flowers need a specific pollinator. I'm gonna show you some other matches. And one thing that's cool to observe is it's kind of like a pollinator language. So certain flowers will be most attractive to certain pollinators. So it might be because of their shape maybe because of their uh, color or their scent. And I'm gonna teach you a secret code. And this, I'm gonna quiz you in a minute. So pay attention because I'm gonna first show you some, uh, some codes and then I'm gonna show you some flowers and you tell me what you think would be most attracted to it. Okay, so here I'm gonna, there's some words in this I'm gonna um, read for folks that might take a little while to, to um, to read. So at the very top, I have the names of four of our pollinators. I'm not going to do all of them right now. So the bat, if we look on the second column from the left, we see that beautiful white flower. So this is the kind of flower that bats usually like to visit. Um, they like white, green, or purple flowers. This is like their favorites. It doesn't mean they won't go to other flowers, but this is like their favorites. Um, they like a strong smell and they like a bowl shaped flower or a flower that's closed during the day. So a flower that opens at night. Who wants to guess why those are the, the attributes or the characteristics of a flower that a bat would like? Think about when a bat is feeding, when they're active. Why do you think they would like white, green or purple flowers and a strong smell? And raise your hand, like. What do you want to guess? Okay, Abby, Jamie, and Lila, Layla. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Can you do it? There you go. Because they're awake at the night, so with the strong smell lets them find the flowers. You're exactly wow. right. Yeah. So imagine, imagine you're hunting at night, right? What's gonna attract you? White, a bright white color, right? We can see white at night even when there's not enough light or a strong smell. So they're gonna use their nose to guide them to a flower. Okay, let's look at the next one, a bird. So hummingbirds are the birds in um, North America that are good pollinators. So they like red, orange, or white flowers. They don't really care about a smell. It doesn't have to have a smell for them. And they like a large funnel-like, so like a um, something that has a big opening and then a long tube or a strong perch to support them. The next one is a butterfly. And so you can see there's a picture of a penstemon, which is a kind of flower that we see a lot in the Sandia Mountains right now. They like bright red or purple. They like a faint but fresh smell and a narrow tube or a wide landing pad. And bees, the last column, so you can see a, this is another kind of penstemon, a blue penstemon. It, they like bright white, yellow, or blue flowers, a fresh or mild smell, and either a shallow um, flower, so not a real deep one, with a landing platform that they can stop on, or a tube. One other really cool thing is, have you guys ever heard of UV colors? Does anybody know what that is? So UV uh, patterns, we can't see with UV, right? Our eyes don't see UV. There are different kind of light wavelengths that comes, but we can't see them. But we can put on special, um, like a special camera or special goggles to see it. And so scientists have been able to take pictures of um, to take photos with these special cameras that show that some flowers have different patterns and bees are one of the animals that can see these different patterns. So the bee might look at that blue flower and they might see lines directing them deep inside the flower to where the nectar is. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so remember for the quiz. So let's look, let's look at, we'll do a quick review before I get to the quiz part. So the bats. They like a white, green, or purple flower, a strong smell. They like a bowl-shaped flower or one that's open at night. 
the birds like a red, orange, or white flower. It doesn't have to have a smell. And it could be either large or funnel-like or a strong perch for support. That's for hummingbirds. Butterflies love red or purple flowers with a faint but fresh smell. And either a long, narrow tube or a wide landing pad for them to, to stop on. And bees like white, yellow, or blue flowers with a fresh smell and either a shallow, not a deep fl uh, flower, or um, a tube. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some flowers and I'm gonna give you a hint. There's no one right answer, but if you wanna guess who visits it, I want you to explain your thinking. So you could say, I think blank visits this flower because it's blank. So you could talk about its color. Obviously we can't tell its scent unless you know that flower. So you may know some of these flowers. So think about color, shape, some of the things that we talked about. Who do you think would like to visit this flower? All right, Jet, Jet and Ella, go ahead and unmute yourselves. You guys are first. Love bees. Because? because? Yellow and they're shallow. Shallow. Do you know what this flower is called, Ellen Jet? Is it a daisy? It is in the daisy family. Yeah, it's called a chocolate flower. So it also has a, a scent. So raise your hand if you agree with Ellen Jet. Do you think that bees might like to visit this? Yeah, and you know what? I don't have any in my garden, but I have a lot of my neighbors have chocolate flowers and they're always full of oftentimes the really tiny bees if you look closely. So I think that's an excellent guess. And I'll, I'll just tell you that from my observation, also butterflies and moths like this flower. Okay, here's another one. So this, I don't know how well it blew up, but um, this one has kind of like a skinny tube. This is called Agastaki, and it does have a smell. Who do you think would like to uh, visit this flower? Who wants to take a guess? Abby, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, that's because it has a strong smell. Uh -oh. Your guess is a bat? Okay, does anyone else want to take a guess? I think I saw someone else. Was it Adelaide and Sage? Do you want to take a guess? Yep. yep go ahead, Adelaide. Hummingbirds. And why do you think hummingbirds? Because, um, because hummingbirds don't very often that they stop. Um, because it's a very bright color and it's, and it's kind of close to red. Kind of purplish, reddish, pinkish, yeah. So the the one of the nicknames for this plant is actually hummingbird mint. So I think this is one that hummingbirds would like. I'm not sure about bats just because it's a little bit too skinny. It's like a pretty small, skinny tube. I think it might be too skinny for a bat to get their nose into. Okay, here's the next one. This is um, desert willow and it has a kind of wide deep tube. I, I don't know if you can tell from the picture and you might have seen this. This is very common in Albuquerque if you live in Albuquerque or central New Mexico. Chat and Ellie, go ahead guys. Um, birds and bats. And why do you think that? Oh, well, that because it has like a wide tube for the nose to go in and they're bright colored bright colored uh-huh yeah so hummingbirds for sure um maybe bats i don't know we I, i'd have to check if it's open at night but but that's a possibility and here's one more and this is another one you might i'll give you a hint if you want to talk about what animal might eat this plant or rely on this plant um then that's a slightly different question, but some of you might recognize it. Does anybody recognize this plant? This is actually milkweed. Does anybody know what animal needs milkweed? Go ahead, Jet and Ella. Butterflies. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so especially monarch butterflies. So the, there's actually a toxin in the leaves of the milkweed, but they have ad uh, adapted and co-evolved with this plant so they can actually eat it and not get sick. Um, however, I will say that I've observed, because I have this plant in my garden, 
there's lots of animals that will drink the nectar. So they can't all eat the, the leaves, but I've seen bees, moths, butterflies, um, so lots of different ones. So good job, you guys. So when you're out and about and you're around flowers, this is a great way for you to like observe and ask yourself a question like, huh, why is that animal visiting that plant? I wonder if it's attracted because of the color or the shape or the time of day. And again, all the pollinators visit lots of different kinds of flowers. So it's not that there's just a one-to-one, -one, except for a couple um, unique ones. And we'll talk about a couple soon. Okay. Um... So, oh, we have another break. I'm, I'm good. I'm trying to do halfway through break. So I'm going to teach you guys a song. I'm going to stop my share for a second. Um, so when it's actually like a chant. So when we're thinking about what animals need, there are four things that they need for their habitat. Does anyone know what the four parts of the habitat are? Do you want to say, um, let's see. Sorry, I'm looking for a couple of hands. Okay, uh, Abby, James, and Lila, do you want to answer? Layla. Layla. They need water, food, plants, and shelter. Was there water, food, shelter? Was there a fourth one? Plants. Okay, but okay, so maybe, so I'm gonna teach you a chant that is actually true for animals and plants. So it's food, water, shelter, and space, right? So every animal and plant will need its own, its perfect amount of space, right? So some will need a lot of space. If you think of like a bear or a mountain lion, they need miles and miles to roam through. But if you think of maybe a small, tiny bee, it may only live in one backyard, okay? So stand up. And we're going to do our little chant. So we're going to go food, no, sorry, food, food in our belly, water, shelter, space. Habitat is my kind of place. Okay, so I'm going to unmute all of you, maybe if I can. I can if you want. Okay, yeah, if you can. Be great. And then we're going to all say it together. There we go. Food, water, water, space, habitat is my kind of place. Let's do it again. Food, water, space, habitat is my kind of place. Good job. Okay, so I'm going to teach you um, a cool way to create more habitat in your backyard, right? So I'll say that this is something I've tried with mixed results in my own home, um, but because you may have different stuff going on in your home, it may still be fun to try. So have you ever heard of butterfly puddling? Does anybody know what butterfly puddling is? So the way butterflies drink, I'm going to show you a picture a little bit later, is they have a long blank. Does anyone know what it's called that comes out of the butterfly's mouth to help them drink? It's how they drink the nectar from the flowers, and it's also how they drink anything else they need. They, that's their only mouth part as an adult. So it's called a proboscis. Can you say proboscis? So butterflies can't um, go to, like, a lake and just, like, pew, drink up the water. They have to go to some moistened earth. So you can try this in your yard. You can get a dish. Just a, This is just a dish that was under one of my pots, right? You can mix some sand with some either compost or if you have it, some um, dried manure. Like if you have cow or horse manure that's been cured. So not like fresh, but something that's been out for a while. So all the maybe germs in it are, have um, died and you mix that in because they don't like just straight up sand. They actually like something with some salts or minerals in it. And you're gonna make a, a little kind of beach in your dish. Um, and if you want, you can also put rocks in. So it was too messy to try to show you with the sand. So you can put rocks in. And then you might get some butterflies drinking in from your puddling area. 
I will say that when I've done it in my yard, um, I've mostly gotten wasps because for various reasons. But one thing I'll mention is that bees, native bees don't drink water at all. They actually get all their water from the nectar. So you won't get nectar, uh, native bees drinking there. You might get honeybees and I would say you probably definitely will get wasps. So just think about that if you decide to try it. So that's a fun thing you can do at home. Oh, have, do we have any questions? Sorry, I haven't stopped for questions yet. I just realized about anything we've talked about already or other questions you came with today while we're stopped. Who has a question about pollinators? Any questions? I don't think I don't think there's any questions. No questions so far. I think you're good. Okay, so let's go back. Okay, we already did this one. Okay, so what foods need animal pollinators? I already asked you and we had the example of cucumbers. Um, who likes cranberries? Raise your hand if you like cranberries. They need animal pollinators. How about hay? Just kidding, I guess you guys probably don't like hay, but who does like hay? So cows like hay and cows make ice cream, yogurt, cow milk rather, um, cheese. So if you eat cheese or ice cream or yogurt made from cow's milk, guess what? The food that they eat depends on animal pollinators. How about blueberries? Raise your hand if you like blueberries. Yeah, oh, I love blueberries. They're one of my favorites. So they also depend on animal pollinators. Um, so these are all foods that are grown in the U.S., but I can think of a lot of delicious things I like to eat that are not grown in the U.S. They're grown in tropical places. So how many of you like to drink coffee? Oh, probably just the parents. <laughs> probably no kids. How about um, mangoes? Do any of you like mangoes? So those are grown in tropical places, not in the U.S. They also need pollinators. And we're gonna look at a couple other great examples from around the world. Who likes bananas? Raise your hand. Okay, yeah, I love bananas. I would be very sad if bananas weren't in my life. So um, the bananas that we eat are what's called domesticated. So they're, they're pretty different from wild bananas and they actually don't reproduce like the way we've been talking. They don't take a seed from a banana and make it into a new plant. Have you ever looked inside a banana to find the seeds? Have any of you guys ever done that? They're like barely there. They're not like crunchy or anything, right? That's because they're, they're not viable seeds. You actually couldn't grow a banana plant from those tiny things that are inside um, the bananas we get from the store. Did you want to say something, Ella? I did um, a science class on one time about bananas and bananas, wild bananas have lots and lots of seeds, but um, bananas we buy don't have much seeds. Yeah, exactly. If you think about like seedless watermelon that sometimes we get now too, they've been bred, changed over time. So they don't have seeds inside them because we're so lazy. We don't like to spit out seeds, right? So same thing with these bananas. They actually will take the cutting of one banana plant and put it in the ground and grow a new one. So they don't even need seeds. So not all plants can grow that way. But wild bananas do need animal pollinators. So I'm going to show you a banana flower. So it's really beautiful, I think. They're actually really huge. They're like this big, the banana flowers. Um, they're originally from Asia. So they're originally from the continent of Asia. But now bananas are raised in tropical areas all over the world. They're raised in Central and South America, Mexico, Africa, anywhere that it's warm enough. Um, so I'm going to quiz you again. I'm going to tell you about this flower and I want you to guess what animal pollinator pollinates it. So the wild banana flower and actually I'm not positive this is a wild banana flower picture. It might be a domestic banana flower, but it's it's similar. The wild banana flower opens at night. It has a strong smell and it has a lot of nectar and pollen. So what 
animal do you think would pollinate this flower? Adeline, let's have you guys choose. Do you want to, can you unmute yourself? Adeline, did you want to try? Is it Adelaide and Sage? Adelaide. Adelaide, you have to unmute yourself, love. There you go. Bats. And why do you think bats? Because it opens at night. Thumbs up if you agree with Adelaide. Yes, you are right. So let's check out the beautiful bat that goes to this flower. Look at that bat. What do you see all over its face, Adelaide? Can you see what's on its face? It's um, nectar. It's not the nectar. What's the powdery stuff inside the flower that would stick to their fur? Pollen. Pollen. Yeah, so kind of like bees are hairy. Well, bats are excellent pollinators because they're so furry. So imagine that bat has been diving its head into the flowers of the banana trees all through the night and look at all the pollen that got stuck on it. But what is it really there for? Is the bat like really wanting to eat the pollen or what's it trying to eat everybody? You can just say, even if I can't hear you. Nectar. Nectar, I'll read your lips, good job. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks to bats, we have bananas. And one thing I'll mention about, even though the bananas we get from the store are not grown from seed, a lot of times um, what happens when we grow things for a long time, humans do in what big plantations. So it's like all bananas, that's where our bananas come from. It's a big area where it's just 100% bananas. And unfortunately that makes those bananas susceptible to diseases. So let's say a fungus might come in and it might kill all the banana plants. So what scientists say is it's good for us to have wild bananas. We can go back there and um, scientists can study their genetics or even use those wild bananas to adapt to make new bananas. So it's good for us to have wild bananas around. Hey, Sarah, we have two questions before we move on. If you're yeah. that. Great. Um, Gabe, and, Gabe and Devin um, submitted two questions. So how does grass grow and does it need to pollinate? And then their second question is, do all bats carry rabies? Okay, well, let's do the bat one first. The answer is no, not all bats carry rabies, just like not all dogs or raccoons or anything. So there are diseases that animals can get, but that doesn't mean that they have them. And speaking of rabies, coincidentally, I just was talking to my, I have a dog and I was talking to my vet about rabies. And he, uh, she was saying that there's no rabies in New Mexico right now. So they haven't had any cases of rabies for years and years. So just something for us to not worry about so much. We should always get our dogs and cats vaccinated for rabies, but we don't need to worry about it. And then the question about grass. So the alfalfa is a type of grass that I showed you earlier, um, but not all grasses use animal pollinators. So some grasses will be pollinated by the wind. So the wind will just blow the pollen from one flower to the other. So it depends on the kind of grass. Good questions, guys. Okay. I think you're gonna get excited. This food that's coming is my like all time favorite food in the world. I can't imagine life without it. It's second, it's bananas are like second after this one. So you might be able to guess I'm talking about chocolate. And unfortunately we cannot grow chocolate or cacao that it comes from in the US. We have to go to somewhere warm, tropical, no snow, no cold nights. So these are called cacao beans. Raise your hand if you knew that chocolate came from cacao beans. So I know nowadays, sometimes we even get the cacao nibs in the store, which is just the, the whole cacao bean that has been chopped up so we can even see what it's like. But where does it come from? Does anybody know? Where do cacao beans come from? Are they in a pod, like a bean that we eat? Is What's it? Max? Um, Max, you want to answer? Um, I believe that they come off some sort of a, some sort of close to a yucca, like that kind of design, and they do not know. They come in uh, no pods, I believe. Okay, that's one guess. Do you want to guess, Ella? coming from trees. Okay, so they do come from trees. They do come in a pod slash fruit. 
but it might be a little different from what you imagine. So here's some cacao uh, fruit. They actually grow directly out of the trunk of the tree. And inside those beans are enclosed in this kind of gooey um, substance. And I've actually lived in Central America and I got to eat the fresh cacao out of this. And so if you open it up, it's kind of like, like I said, gooey inside. And if you suck on the, um, on the seed, so the seed is enclosed in this kind of gooey um, pulp, it's, it's very sweet. It doesn't taste like chocolate at all. It's almost like sweet and like citrusy, like orangey. And then what they do is they'll take the seeds out. They'll dry them in the sun, or sorry, they won't dry them first. First, they'll do what's called fermenting them. So they'll actually group them together, keep them warm. And that'll actually break down parts of the beans to make them so that we can eat them. And then they dry them. And then that's what that looks like in the cacao bean picture. And then they grind them and they add substances to them to make them tasty like, like chocolate. So they taste pretty different if you all have ever had cacao nibs from how they taste as chocolate. Um, so originally, cacao is from the Americas. It's from Mexico, Central America, and South America. So that's where it was first found. And one thing that's really cool, you guys, that you may have heard is that there's evidence that cacao was traded as far north as northern New Mexico as Chaco Canyon hundreds of years ago, um, almost a thousand years ago. So even before the Spanish first came to the Southwest and started to bring things up from Mexico and Central America, there were native people were trading cacao here. So cacao has been in New Mexico for a very long time, but it's not grown here. You do have a question. If, if okay, that go sense. for it. Go ahead, Max. Speaking of cacao beans, the Mayans used to uh, make an early version of hot chocolate as an original with like, uh, I think that they would do as sacrifices. So I didn't catch all that, but Max, you were saying that the Maya used to use um, chocolate to make drinks, special drinks, yeah, is that what you said? Yeah, sort of like a, sort of like hot chocolate, but it was really coveted because the cow beans were expensive. So mm -hmm. it would be only for like either the rulers or the most rich people. And it was usually served at sacrifices or um, huge like gatherings and stuff. So yeah, I don't know too much about it, but I have definitely read that it was used by ancient people in Mexico, like the Maya and the Aztec people, and was very, like you said, coveted. It was something that was very special for them to eat. So who pollinates, oops, who pollinates the, um, the cacao pod? So think to yourself, who pollinates the cacao pod? Sorry, I'm trying to do something. Okay. So here's the flower. Remember I said that it grew out of the trunk. Is that a big flower or a small flower? It's super tiny. Look at the person's finger pointing at it. It's smaller than their fingernail. So who would that be? Do you think it would be a bat? Do you think it would be a bee, a butterfly, something else? A bat would be really big for that one. So who wants to guess? Who do you think pollinates this, this flower? Go ahead, Ella. Maybe a hummingbird? Hummingbird, let's take one more. Anybody else want to guess? Looks like Nicole. Oh yeah, Nicole, go ahead, love. Can you unmute yourself? There you go. Um. A bee, maybe? Okay, so those are both good guesses. So remember I said it had to be someone really tiny. So tiny. It's a fly, a tiny fly called a midge. And I'm going to zoom in a little on this picture. So you can see these tiny, tiny flies are the ones that will pollinate them. They're also called noceums. We actually have um, midges in this family in New Mexico, sometimes they're around at night and they kind of get on you and maybe they try to bite you and they make you itchy. So they're um, apparently the only pollinator that they know of that can get inside the cacao flower and to pollinate it effectively. And they're most active at dawn, 
um, sorry, at dawn and dusk. So at the beginning of the day and the very end of the day. And that's when the cacao flowers open. So they fully open right before sunrise. And then they start to close um, after sunrise. So we enjoy chocolate thanks to flies. And one thing I'll mention is that, um, so we could pick any of these pollinators to learn more about. There's so much to learn, but um, pollinators, flies as pollinators are actually really important. And of 150 families of flies, almost half of them, 70, have been shown to feed from flowers and could therefore transmit pollen from one plant to the other. So we don't often think of flies as being as important as bees, but they, they are important to some plants. Okay, so I'm, I realize I'm running out of time, but I wanna show you a few more um, things about animals and some animals from around the world. So animals who are pollinators often have special adaptations, special things on their bodies that help them to do their job. So check out this amazing bat and its tongue. This is a bat that is not from um, the Americas, but I can't remember where it's from in the world. I think it's from Asia, Megacoropteran. Um, who wants to say what are the, what's special about this bat that would help it to be a really good pollinator when you look at that image? Raise your hand oh, if Nicole. you want to go. Nicole, you want to go? Oh, no, no. You got to unmute. There you go. Um, it would be good to pollinate because the end of its tongue is like fuzzy like bees. So it can collect like the pollen. And yeah. So it's really, really long. Yeah, it so has a really long tongue and it has like feathery stuff on the end to help it collect the pollen. Do you notice it also has a long snout? So bats who are pollinators often have a long snout to, to stick deep inside the flower. Here's another animal, a hummingbird. Check out its tongue. Who wants to say what they think would make it a good pollinator based on its head and its tongue? Ella, go ahead. Um, so its tongue, in the picture it looks like it can split and then come back together. So when it goes in, it could like have it together and then it comes out and it splits and so it collects it. And then when it goes into another plant, it just brushes it all off. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is so cool. You can see, just like you said, it starts out as a single um, tongue and then it goes in and it opens and then it comes back in um, to the mouth closed so it can kind of scoop the nectar back in and kind of a similar structure to the bat tongue where it has little kind of hairs or feathers on it. Um, and it also has a long beak to stick deep inside the flower. Okay, this was the butterfly part I wanted to show you. The butterfly, look at the picture on the left. Sorry, my dog is barking a little bit. Um, do you see its proboscis coming out of its um, head, going deep into that flower? You can see that is a that flower has a really long tube. This is the perfect kind of flower for that butterfly. What color is it? Orange, right? We said it liked bright orange, red, and purple. So it has this long tube, kind of like a straw that it'll stick down into the flower to scoop up the um, nectar. And there's a lot of interesting science about how the proboscis works. And I was reading about it and it was like, I would need a whole other day to study it because it's there's all this complex stuff about suction and how they get it up and everything. So if you any of you are interested in it, I recommend checking it out. Look at this image on the right. This is a special um, microscope photograph of a proboscis and you can see kind of inside the proboscis, which I think is really, really cool. So of course I planned way too many slides for you guys today, but I wanted to at least get to those. Um, and I wanna very quickly show you some superstar pollinators. And then these are ones you can look for in your own backyard. So. This is one that I bet some of you know. Does anybody know this one, who this butterfly is? We see them around a lot. Do you know Ella and Jet? Max, do you know? Oh, I just gave it away, this sorry. Is really <laughs> <laughs> this is the painted lady, and there's a whole bunch of information here, but its superpower is that it can migrate 
2,500 miles. So there's a couple cool superpowers for this animal. It's found on every single continent and it can migrate from Northern Europe all the way to the, uh, sorry, from Northern Europe all the way South to nor North Africa and vice versa. So 2,500 miles, it's the longest known butterfly migration in the world, even longer than the monarch. I'm gonna skip some of this stuff just cause we're, we're getting out of time. Hummingbird moth, another really awesome backyard pollinator. Their superpower is that they're among the fastest flying insects. They can reach speeds up to 30 miles an hour. Raise your hand if you've seen these ever. They will hover um, at the flower just like a hummingbird. So they actually look like a hummingbird at first. Has anyone seen these? No? Wow. Okay, well, keep your eyes out. Okay, Nicole, you have. Maybe you'll see them this summer. And Sarah, just so you know, I'm actually screenshotting all of these so we can share them and they can read them a little bit more on the Nature Ninos page. So okay, awesome. don't feel like you have to like say everything since we're yeah. running out of time, but I, I'll try to get it out to them too. Okay, I'm almost done. So this is a flower fly, ho hover fly or surfed fly. Raise your hand if you've ever seen this one. Once you know what to look for, you might find, you might really realize you see these all the time in your garden because I know I do. They look like a little bee, but they have very short antennae. So that's one of the key things. They don't have any hair on their body. Um, and they are great for your garden because they will eat the bugs that eat your plants. So their larva, their baby form, will eat hundreds of aphids in a month. So those are like little green bugs that sometimes, in fact, I have some on one of my plants um, that will eat the leaves. And is it um, the Abby group of people, Abby, James, or Layla? Did you have a question? I see a hand there. Go ahead. Um, I, I've actually seen a hummingbird, um, uh, like, like in a flower before. A hummingbird? Mm-hmm. Cool. That's awesome. And one more thing I wanted to tell you about surfid flies, speaking about mouths, like we were talking about the bats and the butterflies that have special adaptations in their mouths. Um, these guys actually have a mouth like a sponge. So they'll go into the flower and they'll kind of sponge up the nectar, which I think is pretty interesting. Okay, so I already told you uh, one cool pollinator project, which is to make a butterfly puddling station that I showed you with a dish and some dirt and sand mixed with a little bit of compost or manure. You can go on a pollinator scavenger hunt around your yard or neighborhood and counter draw all the pollinators you see. See if you can find all eight. Although if you're in Albuquerque, you won't be able to find a bat. So maybe it'd be all seven others, non bats. And then also take a look at the flowers and see if you can find the parts that we looked at. We learned about the anthers that have the pollen. We learned about the sticky stigma to attract the pollen and then see if you can find the nectar. Remember I told you it could be in different places inside the flower. So those are some kind of cool projects you guys could try. And just in case you're interested, the website for the place that I work is wildfriends.unm.edu. So do we have time for a couple questions, Sarah? Yeah, sure. Okay, who has a question? I haven't been paying attention to the chat box. Either. Oh, I do remember that Gabe and Devin had a question that didn't get answered. How do yucca grow and do they need to be pollinated? So yucca are really interesting. Um, that's like a whole other talk we could do about yucca because remember how I said pollinators will go to lots of different flowers. Well, in the case of yucca, that is not the case. Um, yucca flowers need a special yucca moth and different species of yucca flowers. So yucca is a family of flowers. And so within that family, there's different species that they each have their own special moth and they need each other. The yucca needs that moth only to pollinate and the yucca moth can only raise its young on the seeds of that yucca flower. So it's a really interesting interrelationship that would um, be a, a really cool talk to do too. And I, I would love to learn more about. So that's a great question. I think that answered the question, right? Yeah, great question, guys. All right, Ella, go ahead, love. I don't really have a question. I was wondering if you wanted to see the flower and bee that I drew. Definitely. So this is the flower. 
Cool. And this is the bee. Cool. Great. I like it. Very nice, Ella. Thanks for sharing. Do we have any other questions or anything else that anyone wants to share with Miss Sarah? Looks like we are good. So I'm actually going to unmute everybody so that everybody can say thank you because you know we always appreciate our guest speakers. All right, you guys are unmuted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, you guys. It was great to yeah. see you. Thank you. I hope you see the pollinators the rest of the summer. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. We really appreciate you coming back. As always, it's super nice to have you and really informative. I always learn so much in your classes too. So um, we appreciate you. And we will be back next Tuesday with our second class in our The World is the Classroom series. So I hope everybody comes back and invite your friends. Um, next step us, next Zoom meeting like this is on Tuesday. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, who's talking? <laughs> okay, so we will see everybody next Tuesday at 11. Have a good rest of your week. At guys. 11. Thank you, Sarah. Bye. It's at 11. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. See you later. Bye. Have a good day.